Hey everyone, today we have a GE dryer in our shop today, and I haven't seen a lot of videos on uh, troubleshooting these newer styles, so we're going to get to it today with some repairs. In this video, we're going to be handling the issue of this electric dryer not being able to heat at all. It will turn on, it will run, it will operate, but no matter what, you will not get heat. So we're going to go through a few different things in this video, starting with the easiest and then working our way to the harder, more complex things. Some of it's pretty easy, some of it will require a little bit more work, but most of it can be done with a screwdriver and a multimeter or a drill gun if you want to do it a little bit quicker. So let's get to it. First, one question is if it's actually heating up but not drying. One early thing to check is the filter and filter housing. If the filter itself has a ton of lint on it or is extremely clogged in the housing, it can prevent your unit from drying clothes properly. Make sure to run warm water over your filter because sometimes dryer sheets can build up an invisible layer of gunk that will prevent heat from passing through the filter. Water should not also pull up on the filter screen at all. It should go absolutely straight through the mesh filter and not pull up again. If it does, just keep running hot water on it to the screen until it's cleaned off. Now to the disassembly. First, move the dryer to where you can access the back of the machine. This test is a little dangerous, so you may want to wear some latex gloves due to dealing with electricity. Alternatively, you could just unplug the unit from the wall and only plug it back in when you need to do the voltage test. At the bottom of the unit, use a quarter inch hex head screwdriver to loosen the screw on the panel at the bottom where the power cord goes in. Open that panel up and inspect where the cord comes in at, which goes to the terminal block. Does anything look damaged, unhook, or burnt? If so, there's your culprit and you'll need to either replace the terminal block or the power cord that comes in. But if everything looks fine, you need to take your multimeter out and set it to the voltage reading. And for this part, you do need to have the unit plugged in, if only for this one test. With the multimeter on voltage AC, use the leads of your multimeter to test each set of posts on the dryer. Middle to left, then middle to right. Both of these should be right around 120 volts. Then test the left side to the right side. You should get at least 208 volts, if not more. Now, if that number is much lower than 208, or the voltage is above 240, either the cord or breaker have an issue. You could always try to trip the breaker to the dryer all the way off, then all the way on to attempt to reset it. Now, if this gets your dryer to heat, congratulations, you fixed it, but if not, the cord or outlet is bad, and that job could be more for an electrician if the outlet is bad or something in the breaker box. Going back to the terminal block, there's also a fuse at the very bottom of the housing that we want to inspect. Take your multimeter and set it to ohms resistance or continuity. Then use the leads of your multimeter and put it to each side of the fuse. If the fuse is bad, you would not get continuity through it. If the fuse is good, you should get about 0.00, .00 on the multimeter. For example, in this unit, the fuse is good. Now let's get to the control system. Take your screwdriver and remove the two screws on each side of the plastic unit. They are a quarter inch hex head or you could use a fillet bit as well. Next, you want to remove the four screws that hold the metal back on, the same style as the two you just took out. Once you have these four screws out, slide the panel up and then out. It's important that you notice the schematic is located here, which will have technician info. Take your multimeter and set it to ohms resistance or continuity. Your unit may be slightly different than this one, and the wire colors and timer positions may be a little bit different, so reference your schematic for the exact labels. But once you figured it out, place the leads of your multimeter on the correct two terminals on the dryer timer. In the case of most models, they're probably going to be labeled A and B on the schematic, and it'll tell you where they are labeled on the timer. Once you have the lead securely pressed into the timer, rotate the knob to the various settings on the dial. The schematic will show you which mode should allow the contacts and the timer to connect, giving the dryer heat. I personally always use the high heat mode. The multimeters then should show a reading of 0.00, .00 ohms or beep in the continuity mode. If you keep rotating the dial and never get a reading and it just shows OL, the timer is bad, but also make sure to check the dial and stem of the timer shaft itself. The shaft or the dial could be damaged to where it's not actually rotating at all. And if that's the case, you'd want to replace the knob or the timer itself if the shaft is damaged. Now let's go ahead and dig into the front of the dryer. There are two screws on the rear of the chassis, one on each side that needs removed with a Phillips head screwdriver. Now at this point, you could get a picture of the wires. 
and then remove all the wires from the top of the console to take the wire trunks off the rear of the dryer to access the front. But even though some videos tell you to do this, you don't really have to do this to access the front of the GE dryer. Let's go ahead and skip ahead and take the two screws out of the front of the dryer here. You will use a Phillips head screwdriver to remove both of these screws, one on the left, one on the right inside the door. You can then take a screwdriver to pop the top of the dryer. You can angle it ajar slightly to either side. Now there are two hex head screws, one on each side of the dryer that need taken out. Once you have both of these removed, you can then pull on the door to get ready to remove it. On some models of GE dryers, there's going to be a light switch harness on the left side at the top as you see here, but not all do. You'll need to press into the harness and then remove it. But this is the most difficult part, I think, of dealing with a GE dryer. To remove the door, you need to simply pull up on it to get it off the three fingers at the bottom of the dryer. However, the wire harness for the door lock will prevent you from moving this door very far away from the unit. The wire harness to the door lock is very short. You can carefully move the door to the left side and then remove the harness. But the one way that may be a little bit easier is to angle the door forward and rest it on a heavy box or use a chain to hold the door at an angle so it doesn't fall too far forward off of those hinges at the bottom. This will give you access to the wire harness from the rear. Either way, you have to move the horribly designed plastic cover to the side, then press into the harness and remove the wire harness from the door switch housing. If you split the door to the side, it uninstalls the same way, and it's your choice on how to handle it though. But at either rate, once the harness is removed, you can remove the door and move it aside away from the unit. Note that some models of GE dryers have the door light switch down where the door harness is, and some of them don't. Now let's go ahead and take the drum to the dryer out. We have to remove the idler pulley first, which is directly behind the blower motor housing. This dryer does not have a ton of room for your left hand, but quite a bit for your right, and that's the one you want to focus on. From the camera view on the inside to the right, this is what you're going to see. You can use your right hand to pull the pulley to the right, and the secret is if you pull far enough, there's a little tab on the motor mount of the unit that you can hold the idler pulley in place to remove the belt. The metal of the pulley can rest here, allowing you to have an easier time to release the belt from the idler. Here's another angle of that same action, but I didn't actually realize that this unit had that little mounting part. You want to make sure that the belt is removed from where the motor mount is, so even though it's loose, you need to move it away from that metal pulley that is on the motor. Otherwise, when you try to pull the drum out, it could snag on the belt mount like you see here. I was so focused on getting the right camera shots, I didn't realize that the belt was going to snag. Whoops. Now, if you didn't take the entire top and console off, the best way to take the drum out is to angle the back of the top of the dryer against a wall slightly like you see here. It will rest the console and the top, and you can put a box to hold it in place so it doesn't get too far away. This will allow you to take the drum out or put it in quite easily. Use the belt when it's free of the pulley and motor to pull up and then out on the drum. The metal sides of the dryer have little grooves in them that will show you kind of like the shape of the drum so you can pull it out directly. If you pull up too far or too low, it won't be within that little oval. It'll rub on the sides or make a noise when it comes out. With the dryer now open, it's time to inspect the heating element area as it's a major culprit as well as all the sensors. You would want to look for any physical damage or burn marks to anything on the heating element unit that would be quick proof that it is damaged. It, now, if the dryer was heating but not drying properly, chances are there's a lot of lint buildup inside the chassis or inside the door where the filter goes in. In my case here, I'm going to go ahead and take precaution by cleaning the chassis out. The motor does feel like it's binding slightly due to dirt. I'm using a shop vac, which is good, but it's not going to get all the small areas of the dryer. I would suggest getting a dryer cleaning kit that has a small flexible hose to get any of the small parts and areas of the dryer, especially where the motor is. I'll have a link to the kit in the description because it's very possible if there's a ton of lint, it could have blocked either something in the motor or the vent or blower housing assembly, causing the dryer to heat up but not allow the air to push out the dryer vent and ductwork, leading to really poor drying conditions. One of the most common culprits on this style dryer now, if it's not heating at all, is the purple wire in the lower right corner of the dryer. It should look like this in its perfect silver colored shape. This actually works on the dryer, but if it looks different, it's damaged, burnt, or otherwise charred, you're going to need to replace the wire 
GE does make a replacement wire kit for this particular issue, and I will include a link to it in the description. But you should also inspect the spade terminal because if it's burnt up, it's very possible that the terminal on the heater pan itself is bad, and you may need to replace both the wire and the entire heater unit as well, and I will have a link for that entire heater pan as well in the description. To test the heating element though, let's set your multimeter to ohms resistance or continuity. Use a pair of needle nose pliers to remove one of the two wires going to the heating element on the left side. Be very careful when you do this though, the edges on this plate are razor sharp and you can get cut. Using your multimeter leads, press them into both spade terminals on the element and check for an ohm reading. You should get about 43 ohms of resistance between the two leads on the left side of this heater pan. If it's very far off from 43, or you get an OL symbol, then the element is damaged and you need to replace the entire heating element. Next, try the same test taking the purple wire spade connector off on the right side. Keep the multimeter on its own resistance and test the leads from the spade with the purple wire to the upper and lower connections on the left side. Regardless of what you choose, you should get between 21 ohms of resistance on either the upper or lower unit. If it's very far off from this number or you get an OL symbol, the heater or connector on the heater wire is bad and it needs replaced. Let's start out by testing the drum outlet thermostat. Take your multimeter and set it to ohms resistance. You want to take one lead of the two larger spade terminals in blue off using a pair of needle nose pliers. Then press the leads your multimeter to each side of the spade. You should get some sort of signal or about 0.00 or 0.01 ohms or again the beeping noise. If you get that, your sensor's good. If you get an OL symbol, it's bad and needs replaced. You can also test the orange wires on the side using the same type of test, but you want to use ohms resistance and you need to get about 9,000 ohms or 9.0K ohms. That would be a good average value. If it's much higher or lower than that, maybe more than 10 or 15% off, you would need to replace that. Next, let's check the safety fuse on the top left side of the pie plate heater. When testing, make sure not to touch or bend the coils on the heater itself, but you're going to do the same test we just did. Pull one wire off and set to ohms or continuity. You need to get 0, 0.00 ohms or again hear that beep. If you get an OL symbol or no beep, that means the unit is bad and needs replaced. We're going to now do the same test for the control inlet thermostat. Remove one wire and keep the multimeter set to ohms or your continuity setting. Using your multimeter, test for a signal or 0, 0.00 ohms. If you get a noise or 0, 0.00, it's good. But if the multimeter stays on OL while you're testing the spades on the sensor, it is bad and needs replaced. And you can do the same test on the smaller wires on the left and right side. The same type of ohm reading should be what you got on that blower housing just a few moments ago. The other fuse we want to test here is the thermo high limit. You're going to do again the same exact test. Remove a wire, use the leads of the multimeter, and test for ohms or continuity. Yet again, you want 0.00. .00. If you get an OL symbol, then it's bad and needs replaced. These are all the major steps I would take in dealing with your GE dryer, either not heating or drying your clothes. If everything looks to be okay, I would make sure all the wire connections are intact and not possibly unhooked. Another thing to check for would be a floating neutral situation if it's present. Floating neutral is where the dryer powers on and runs, but your voltage drops when it's actually in use. You would test this unit with a multimeter and voltage at the terminal block, and you would need to make sure that the unit is running and get at least 208 volts. If it starts and runs and the voltage suddenly drops when it powers on, then there's an electrical issue somewhere between the outlet and the breaker itself or in the electrical box itself, and that is far beyond the terms of this video. So with that done, let's go ahead and put the drum back in for testing. Remember the idler pulley trick earlier? I would go ahead and pull it and have it set on the motor housing before we put the drum in. The drum has two grooves in it. Make sure the belt rests on the rear one where the black outline of the belt is. If yours is slightly different, it may be in a different position though. Angle the top of the dryer back against the wall like we did when we took it out. Place something to hold the top up and then go ahead and take the dryer drum by the belt and slide it into place. The bearing on the rear of the drum should go in straight into the back of the bearing housing. Turn the drum slightly to make sure there aren't any obstructions or any weird noises that would suggest that it didn't get put in right. On the right side of the drum, this is what I see and how I need to put the idler pulley back into place by releasing the tension. 
But before you do that, make sure the belt is wrapped around the motor pulley properly so that when you release that tension, it goes on perfectly. This process could take a time or two to get right, but hopefully the camera kind of explains the mystery of the process. With the drum in place, you should be able to gently turn it and see the blower housing move along with the belt so everything here is engaged properly. You can also listen to any obstructions that could cause or suggest something to get installed right. Now go ahead and put the door back on. The bottom of the door is going to rest on these three metal fingers on the dryer chassis. Set the door onto the fingers and then pivot the door forward to the bulkhead. I would go ahead and rest something on the door front so you can reinstall the door lock at this point. Move the stupid plastic cover out of the way. Reinstall the door switch harness into the door like you see here. Hopefully the plastic cover doesn't snap and slash you in the fingers like they like to do on GEs. When you pivot the door into place, you're going to have to get the bearing of the drum to rest on the door frame. This can be a little bit difficult, so you may have to open the dryer door and wedge it into place by moving the drum against the bearing, but it will seat into place. When you put the front of the door on, also make sure to notice that there are metal tabs on the inside of the door and on the sides of the chassis of the machine. These little fingers need to line up to make sure the chassis gets aligned properly. If you did anything to bend or warp the door slightly when working on the machine, it may not fit into place, which could make it look like the door just won't go back on. But once you have the front on, go ahead and insert the two short screws back into the top left and top right sides of the dryer. Both of these are quarter inch hex screws. If your door light harness was on top like mine, you'll need to go ahead and insert it back into place. Next, you'll want to secure the top of the dryer to the chassis. It needs brought forward and snapped into place. The rear is off a little bit, but we can get that adjusted easily off camera. With the top kind of secure, you can actually just go ahead and test the dryer to see if what you did worked. Plug the dryer in and see what happens. In the case of this dryer, we actually fixed the unit perfectly. It's running great. There's no noise from it at all. It's operating fine, and we haven't even actually put it all back together. It's also heating, and the temperatures look good. The sensor shows that the temperature keeps going up and up, and if you didn't do the installation processes to this point right properly, then you may have overlooked a wire harness and need to go back and check, or there's another difficult problem that this video sadly does not cover. Let's go ahead and finish putting the dryer back together, though. Take the two long Phillips head screws and reinsert them to the top part of the dryer door. This will secure the top part of the dryer to the front of the cabinet. Now go ahead and insert two identical screws at the rear of the unit, one on left, one on right side. If you had unplugged any wires, go ahead and reinstall them at this point, but we did not. To get the console snapped back into place, the six fingers need slotted into these holes properly. You'll then pivot the console back into place and then tap on the rear of the console to push it forward to lock it into place. Before putting the metal back on, you need to reinsert the ground screw with the ground wire from the inside going to the outside. It's a quarter inch hex head, and when you have that done, there's a small metal finger on the left back that needs slotted into the plastic console. Then go ahead and slot the right side into place. It was bent a little bit, so I had to bend that with my screwdriver. Once that's done, you're going to install the four screws on the metal housing, right side and left. The last step now is to just install the two top hex head screws that go down in from the console into the metal top of the dryer. One on the right, one on the left. These are all the major fixes that you'd want to take doing your dryer and now it's back to being fully assembled. I hope this video helps you out. All the major parts that we looked at for this dryer are going to be in the description of the video. Now if you click on the links and purchase the parts through those links, it does help me buy more appliances to test, review, and fix. I also have two or three other videos on this exact GE dryer that we shot all at the same time. This video should now be displaying on the screen, so if you have any more questions, they may be able to help you. Have a great day.